Hello, everyone. It's April 12th, 2017, and this is your episode 93 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi. With me, as always, are my hosts, Laurel Black. Hi. And Megan Arns. Hello. Ben Charles, how's it going, buddy? I'm doing well. How are you, Casey? Fine, thanks. We had Gordon Stout on campus today. Ooh. We did. I saw him last week. Really? Right. Yeah, because yeah. you were you were there, right? Yeah. <clears throat> oh yeah. Gordon's so great. It's a small world. Did he yeah. did he just do a class? Did he play a recital? What did he do? He did a class. Nice. Yeah, he was passing through, so we piggybacked a little master class off of uh our friend in Radford. Cool. Yeah, so thanks Rob Sandrell for doing that. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you guys, our guest today is a drummer and dance virtuoso. He is known for his energy, athleticism, and precision on stage. He comes from a lineage of drummers and dancers, and today he's one of the leading Ghanaian dancers of his generation. He's with us today from Cal Arts in Valencia, California, where he teaches, and he's right there in person. So, you guys, this person who looks like a... He looks like a movie star, but he's actually a drummer. So he's like <laughs> hands down the most handsome drummer I've ever seen. How's that for an introduction? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say, I, I guess he's a dancer, so it makes sense he's this handsome. But anyway, you guys, this is Nani Agbelli. How are you doing? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate the great introduction. <laughs> So would the term man crush apply here, Casey? I feel like maybe it would. I mean, possibly. I don't know. I always, I always thought Ben was the best looking drummer in the. <laughs> <laughs> people people often confuse Nani and me, so we get that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yep, no doubt. Hey, well, why don't you give us a little rundown of what you're doing there in Mizzou with Megan? Um. So I'm 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 down here to kind of um, help establish and also advertise, um, you know, the Ghanaian part of the world music um, uh, courses that Megan is teaching here or introducing here, um, just to bring more awareness to the program and get more people to know about it and sign up for it and be involved and uh, yeah, share and share it more to other people. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. So does that consist of a concert or maybe a, yeah, maybe a so circle dance I've class? Yeah, so I've been here. Um, <laughs> I've been <laughs> <Whoa>! <laughs> <laughs> so I've been here since uh, Monday. I've been here since Monday and uh, I've been going to classes. I've been going to rehearsals, um, workshops, and just trying to work with the community the students and you know as much as i can get myself out there at the school um and we have the concert on friday um so you know her group um of students who've been on top of rehearsals and trying to get a lot of things done uh, before friday so yeah it's been it's been classes workshops and rehearsals towards the performance of friday yeah, yeah. wonderful and this project has kind of been uh personal goal of mine for a while because I studied uh, in Ghana 10 years ago for three weeks, took a trip there and was at the center that Nani's family runs. And I'd always somehow wanted to share that with my some aspects of that with my students and eventually hopefully take them to Ghana with me. Um, so the first step I kind of identified was getting back into learning some more of the music and the dancing and um, and bringing someone in. So I met Nani in Chicago a couple of years ago mm -hmm. and I saw him teach and I was like, that's the person. <laughs> 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 that's who I need to bring to my school. And um, so I started working on it then, finding funding and kind of developing this project. Mm -hmm. But I went to, out to CalArts to study with him um, over the Christmas break and have been teaching mm -hmm. material to my students all semester kind of in preparation for his visit and for this concert. So yeah, this is the poster. It's become a joke now because one of the sources we got funding from was a student organization that requires you to use a percentage of your funding for advertising. 
And I feel like you can do so much on the internet for free now that I was like, okay, I'll just make $250 worth of posters. <laughs> so I have like thousands of postcards and like everywhere we go, I'm like shoving it in people's face and <laughs> inviting them to his own concert <laughs> every hour. So It still makes sense to make posters. Post People still does. see posters. I, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, what do you got there? Yeah, so I had a question. Um, I was actually, I was in, I can't remember where, Illinois <laughs> over this past weekend, and I did a, a little duo recital with my duo partner at Olivet Nazarene University. Um, and one of the faculty members there, his name is Andy Miller. Andy's a friend of mine from grad school. Um, and Andy has studied extensively Malinke drumming, which is West African. Um, and I actually had invited Andy to be a guest co-host tonight, but he couldn't make it. Um, but when I told him who our guest was, he said, oh, he does A-way drumming. I don't really know anything about that. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> I knew, like, they're both West African drumming styles. So could you tell us in particular about A-way drumming? What makes it different from other West African drumming styles? Well, it's not even just A-way drumming. It's like Ghanaian drumming. Yeah. Because, um, if because uh, you know, in Ghana, every region has you know its own um traditional music and dance and and cultural and all that stuff so um if you want to talk about it you want to compare the whole cultural and drumming in the country to this um other country um but the thing is uh in in terms of specific since we're talking about airway drumming um even when you go to a different region, like my region is Volta region. When you go to Ashanti region, the music they play there is 100% different from what we play at the Volta region. If you travel up north and you go to the northern region, what they play there is totally different. So, um, and that's one cool thing I think uh, uh, about, about Africa in general, not just, uh, you know, part of Africa is that, no, uh, depending on where you go, like our music from one country to the next is totally 100% like totally different. And there is a lot of, you know, uh, there is a lot of cool things about that. There might be some similarities depending on the neighboring um, border country, but a lot of it is totally different. And, you know, you will have no idea about it. Like when I go to um, some, uh, when I go to Nigeria, I, I really will not have any idea. Probably ninety percent will not have any idea about their music, and I have to I have to learn it, or you know I can teach it. I have to bring someone in to teach it. But Nigeria is a neighboring uh, country to Ghana, so yeah. So with all these different music styles, is there influence between them? Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, especially like in Ghana. Even though, you know, each region has totally a different thing going on, the country is promoting a lot on uh, working together. Each region is working together and learning each other's um, culture and music. And so what, the, excuse me, what the country has, um, the government has uh, started like way, way back is for every single school from kindergarten to, to university level, must have a cultural thing going on at the school. And what they do, what we do at the end of every year is we put on a competition in the area. So we do area competition, then it becomes a district competition, then it becomes a regional competition. Um, and when you go to the regional level, what the governments require from you is playing at least three different music or pieces from different region mm. is is required as part of your competition and if you cannot or if you if you don't play it perfectly to what it's supposed to be from that region you don't you don't get to be part of the prize winners and stuff like that so you know it, it's been it's been pushed a lot and a lot of people are taking advantage of that. So like I am from the Volta region, but I can do any major main pieces from any of the regions in Ghana. And that's because of, you know, part of it is because of this um, promotion and this thing that the government is trying to push. Mm. Cool. That's interesting. How long has that been going on? 
Um, at least since the seventies. Okay. Yeah, since the seventies, because I know growing up um, in elementary school that was already happening. Because so, I was part of a group in elementary school, and you know that was part of that was part of it mm-hmm. when I was growing up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I have a, a sort of landmine of a question here because this could probably take up the rest of the podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, when I heard Andy talk, he actually talked kind of extensively about the the history of all this. And he had some really interesting insight of there was European colonization and then you know, the folk music came back out of that. And I know Megan had uh, said you guys were talking about preserving cultural identity so could yeah. you tell us a little bit about the history of airway drumming? Well, the history of airway drumming is, 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 it doesn't have, like, I cannot give you a straight answer. That's the thing. Because it doesn't come from, the history doesn't come from one place. It comes from different places. And the reason is because airways are not originally from Ghana. They migrated. They migrated from Benin. Moche, and then traveled down Nigeria, Togo, and then came to Ghana. And so, you know, when they brought some history and cultural stuff from Benin and then came to meet some in Ghana. So, you know, it, it depends on the piece you're talking about. It, the history can be from Ghana and related to um, the colonization and the British and stuff like that. And depending on the piece, it can come from Benin and stuff like that. So, for example, if you're talking about a piece like Agbeko, Achi Agbeko, Achi Agbeko, you know, part of the story, part of the history is that it's, um, it's a piece that was designed and created to, to, to uh, commemorate um, the fight and the war that uh, our ancestors went through to maintain and take possession of the property that we, the new generation, now uh, holds so uh, some of the songs which actually I'm doing with um, Allison. There is one song that you know that talks about uh, fighting between the white people and 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 the black people, the Ghanaians. You know, and um, so like story like that, like a, a piece like that. Then then there is a relationship like that which has a history from um, colonization and the British. And then when you talk about a piece like um, Ajogbo. Ajogbo is totally brought down from Benin to to Ghana. And so like a piece like that has nothing to do with colonization or, you know, British or anything like that. So, you know, depending on on, on what the focus is and what 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 we're talking about, it changes at least for the Voltarians. It does. Yeah. Awesome. But they did, they did, actually, I want to add this, but they, they did bring a lot, like guitar, the beginning of guitar in Ghana was brought, was brought by the British, you know, there mm-hmm. they were certain instruments that they brought either to trade with some of our instruments or to trade for other things in the country, uh, but that was, that was how high life kind of started you know when high life started it started with a guitar you know it was just someone sitting down playing guitar and singing songs about people and gossiping and stuff like that then as time went on it started building up and then you know it changed into adding drum set and all this kind of uh, uh, stuff Mm -hmm. so they did bring something and left something musically um, with us and uh, which we're still like using yeah yeah, wow, wonderful. Ben, you said you were at all of it Nazarene, is that right? Yeah, I think you were there a few years ago. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Did you see Matt Jacklin? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, good, good, good. Him and Andy were, were a blast. Um, you know, Nadi, I wonder if you could uh, you could tell us a little bit about the center your family runs in Volta. Awesome. Um, I don't remember which year, but when my dad started his career, my dad was an actor, a drama dancer, singer. So he and he was part of, um, you know, part of his job for a while was the chair of the folklore music in Ghana. So we, the family, traveled a lot. I mean, moved a lot from region to region, uh, which was cool, but also hard on the family, depending on, you know, how you think about it. Um, but um 
what he did at a point was he was performing and there was uh, this student from the U.S. was uh, watching him perform and was moved by his performance. And so then, uh, you know, helped him to gain access to working in the U.S. So he started like traveling to the U.S. to work over here and things like that. And then students started following <clears throat> him from the U.S. to Ghana to study with him. Um, and then he was going from like one person to like three people to like five, and then he was getting more and more. So then he had then, uh, you know, and he didn't have a, a place to kind of teach, um, the people. So then he decided to like build a place so that, you know, those students, when they come, they can have a place to stay and all that stuff. So in 1990, he completed the center, uh, which is Dagbe Cultural Institutes and Arts Center up in the Volta region, um, you know, at uh, a, a town called Aflau, close to the border of Togo. So he, he started, he built that place and started like hosting students. So students will come there. It, it is an all-inclusive um, facility. So you come there, you stay there, you sleep there, you eat there. So breakfast, lunch, dinner there. Um, you take four hours classes there, two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. You have access to the beach. The beach is probably like 15, 20 minutes away. Um, and then, you know, you go to the traditional markets and uh, you get to learn between all the cultural things that goes on in the country. You get to choose from any of them that you, you, you want to specialize in and, uh, you know, study that. Student comes from anywhere from two weeks or like a year. There was, there was a couple of times we had students who came there for uh, what's... Um, uh, a, a year, a year, two months, um, and studying the music every day for the uh, four hours a day um, for the whole time. So you know, yeah, so that that is, and mostly we get like uh, uh, we get like groups from universities. So we get groups from uh, Tufts University. Um, we get groups from um, Berkeley College of Music, Bowling Green University. And, you know, we have high school groups that also come there. And then we have, you know, travelers who just passes by and then just want us to perform for them or just to give them a little, you know, tour and a little taste of what goes on there and stuff like that. So, yeah, it, it is, um, you know, it is a really um, beautiful um, um, place that still holds strongly the tradition of the country and specific um, things that's supposed to be going on in the country uh, out at the center. Yeah. Wow, wonderful. I, uh, I have a question for Megan. Yes. So, Megan, I would love to know because you, you're our world expert here. And hmm, expert? <laughs> well, I mean, amongst, you know, between. Closer than ben the rest of I. us for sure. <laughs> <laughs> between Ben, Laurel, and I. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I think we're all in agreement here that we want these things to be taught and, and we think these things are wonderful. And I wonder, I'd love to hear in your own words, mm -hmm. you know, why you think this is really valuable and what you think it brings and, you know, just your feelings about it. Sure. Well, I, there are two parts to that, my answer, I think. And one is, um, involves culture and the other involves uh, music. So I think um, a student going through a four-year curriculum in percussion that was only studying one tradition in percussion and there being, well, okay, wait, sorry, I'm not studying with, did I say I'm sorry with music or did I say culture? <laughs> I'm switching to music. So a student that's studying for four, in a four-year undergraduate institution, I think, you know, okay, if you're, if you are on a straight path to being in an orchestra, then that's great you know, do that. If you're on a straight path and going somewhere, that's great. But I think for, we, we know the challenges of the, of the current job market in these different areas of percussion. And I think, um, percussionists who are more well-rounded and exposed to a lot of different styles of music, um, I don't want to say are more likely to have a job, but are marketable, um, because we're not doing one thing, you know, you have experience with different kinds of music and if I could, if so, I could add to that, 
That yeah. was actually a direct factor in me getting this job that I did have world music experience, especially steel band, which I'm by no means an expert in, but they wanted someone that could teach their steel band and I had a little bit of experience. So yes, that is very true. <laughs> Yeah, so for collegiate instructors, for elementary school teachers who can introduce students to not just one type of music, you know, um, for middle school teachers, high school teachers, um, for people who are going to be teaching at community centers, whatever, I think it's helpful to um, not just be good at one thing, but to have several tricks in your bag, whether that's, you know, different styles of music on one instrument or different areas or whatever. So I think it helps in the job market. I think as a musician, one of the main reasons that I incorporate it in my curriculum is because learning by ear is such a different experience. And that experience that I had, I wasn't exposed to, I'm pretty, pretty safe to say I wasn't exposed to any African music until I went to Ghana, directly exposed, you know, like studying it. I remember like sitting in because my my teacher Michael Bump at Truman. I said I'm going to Ghana. He's like, Do you know anything about music in Ghana? I, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. You know, I just I was like, I want to do this, and so we were like printing off articles, and he was like teaching me a timeline, wow. and yeah, I knew nothing. You know, and then I went and like I had such a hard time the first few days because I'd never I don't think I'd ever learned anything by ear before. Mm -hmm. you now I grew up in a five and drum corps, and some things were taught by ear a little bit, but. I really, I was like, oh, I have to write this down. I have to write this down. How am I going to remember this? Mm. I can't process this. I was like freaking out, you know? It was such a different experience. And um, when I returned, I kind of that kind of stuck with me. And, you know, I tried to keep learning different things by ear through studying different traditions and things like that. But by incorporating into my curriculum here, I, find, I feel like I'm, the students are becoming better musicians by using their ears, you know? They're, they are they're able to pick up things faster. They're able to remember things better, you know? And so I've definitely seen a pretty direct in outcome just by teaching things that are taught by ear, not just read through the page. So I could talk about this for an hour because I really believe in it. But from the music side or from the culture side, I think people who, uh, okay, maybe I shouldn't say this, but People should travel. People should like experience other parts of the world. People should meet people who aren't the same color as them. You know, people should experience. And when I say should, I feel pretty strongly about Americans should learn what it feels like to be in the minority. What does that feel like? You know? And so I think by introducing a different style of music or a different culture and turning people onto that, you never know what you're doing by introducing someone to something. So maybe down the road, someone will go to Ghana or they will remember this experience and they will have a meet a Ghanaian friend or join an African culture club or go to a black church, you know, or something and have that experience. Um, that's not just what they grew up with. And I think that's even more important in the middle of the country here where we are less diverse for sure. And so I feel pretty great responsibility to kind of introduce my students to things outside of their world, current worldview. I, love, I mean, I love you know, I want to add a little before, um, you know, we move on. Um, I think we all agree that, you know, as a performer, expression is one of the biggest thing. I mean, if it's not the thing, it's, you know, one of the biggest part of who we should be or what we should be doing on stage. Because the more you can express yourself as a performer on stage in the classroom, the more freer your audience or your students will be around you. Uh, and so, and that is what the Ghanaian music or the African music brings to the table. It helps you because you're not looking on anything. You're not concentrating on anything apart from concentrating on the audience because you, you learned ed everything by ear and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So all you need to, all the energy that you have to put in reading whilst you're playing or anything like that goes then into expressing yourself to the audience or to your student or to your teacher, whatever it is. And, and so, you know, that's one strong part of Ghanaian music. You learn by ear and when you master it, all you do is play it because it's, it's in the body, it's ingrained in the system. So then all you're doing is playing, then you have all this room and this rest of your being 
to express yourself and you get into the audience that way you impress the audience that way you drag the audience to what you're doing that way and they get connected that's yeah nice. i love that that's awesome yeah ab- absolutely so yeah and i mean also just if we're talking directly the music that we're working on this week you know i mean there are so many the music is so complicated it's mm-hmm. so and i mean we are barely barely scratching the surface and uh, I think that's really good for the students and myself to see that, you know, this is not something that you can take and write down on a piece of paper and perform it. It takes years and years and it belongs to someone and it's not meant to be written down. It belongs to a group of people. And if you want to learn it, you need to talk to the people who own that music right right? and you need to bring them to your school and you shouldn't write it down on a piece of paper in a book and sell it right you shouldn't do that (laughs) and so i think that that's a very direct experience of like you know african music in the classroom that's quotes Mm -hmm. if we're in video or not but um you know i think that would be a lesson to all of them that this is a very deep tradition a very treasured tradition and um, and it is in danger. It could be in danger of going mm-hmm. extinct if if mm-hmm. um, if we take it and we write it down and we sell it and we kill it <laughs> instead of you know bringing in people who who own who own the music and who who live the music and are a part of the culture and support no, them. Nani, would you mind transcribing and writing all this stuff down for me so I can put it in a book and sell <laughs> it? <That> would... <laughs> Actually, it, it, it will cost you a lot. I don't think I don't think you can pay for it. It's life. It costs you his well, life. Well, well, we should talk. Ben and I could pool some money together. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not going to cost you money, buddy. <laughs> do people like uh, ask you that? Like, hey, can I help you write a book? And can you? Oh yeah! It? Oh yeah! I've had a lot of people requested for me to work with them to write a book. Um, you know, and make it and make a DVD and all those things. So it's like a combo thing, and and markets. I've, I've had a lot of people, you know, ask you me to do that. that. Oh, I, I, I mean, you know, I, as much as I try to or we try to bring this culture and music awareness to people. There will still be some out there that are very ignorant about, you know, about the whole thing. And, you know, that's fine. That's that's who we are as people. That's fine. So we just try to educate them. At least I try to educate them as much as possible. So when people like approach me with stuff like that, of course, my I'm a human being. My first reaction is, you know, to get really offensive and uh, offended and stuff like that but then i have to be like you know what they're not from ghana they really don't understand what this culture is about so you know use this opportunity uh, and and you know talk to them and educate them about it and i do and and so then it end up by me saying no can do you know yeah so I've, I've we've had like back back when i was in ghana we've had people come in or groups come in and all they want to do is videotape us you know, play and perform and they videotape us and they go away. You say, oh, sit down, let me teach you. They are like, no, 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 just just play the stuff. I want to, I just want to video record it. And we're like, okay, sure. And then we set up and all we do is play improvisations. We don't, we don't play the real thing. We just improvise for every single instrument and they take it back and they cannot use it. And then you steal and, their video cameras you and you know, smash them and destroy So them. We, we also have come up with how to, you know, go around mm-hmm. it if, 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 if we don't want you to take it away and you're pushing for it for us to do it, you know. So um, hopefully, you know, people will start understanding that and start getting more involved than using technology um, to kind of like get it away. So Megan, I um, love that you said people should travel, people should go to these places. I think like should doesn't, it's correct, but it doesn't even quite hold enough weight, you know, because you're, you're so right. You know, it's, it's an important thing to be doing. It's not like, oh, you should because you'll enjoy it or you'll, you'll be more, you'll know more about the world. It's like, yeah, that's like the simplest benefit of it. I mean, there's so much more to, you know, I mean, what, what it does for you. Absolutely. Sorry, Ben, what were you saying? Yeah. So in a, in a twist of irony, after Megan went on this big, long rant about not writing books, some hack job named Steve Schick did write a book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I wanted to read a quote from Mr. Schick out of his book. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of a long one, so bear with me here. But it's about 
West African drumming. This is Steve Schick talking. He says, Steve Reich visited Ghana on a study trip of, of the music of West Africa and the year before he composed drumming. As a result, he has repeatedly been asked about the role of African and other non-Western sources on his subsequent music. He answered these questions eloquently in his writing about music, sections of which were reprinted as the notes for his recording of drumming. Here he stated that for him, the study of African music was confirmation. I can think of no more illuminating comment than this for a percussionist who seeks to disentangle issues of globalism and cultural homogeneity that surrounded current practices in contemporary percussion music. Yes, the use of drums in tightly cycling periodic patterns in drumming is a quality found in African music, just as the heavily nested contrapuntal structures where several simple parts combine to create a complex whole is a characteristic of Indonesian gamelan. But the former is also part of every jazz drummer's vocabulary thanks to African American, sorry, African-American music, and the latter is a technique well known to anyone who loves the music of Bach. Drumming does not appropriate ideas from other cultures. It confirms them and resonates with them. And I could go on reading Mr. Schick's book, but that's the long and short of it. So, Wow, cool. Yeah. As yeah, soon as Megan started in. talking, I just thought of that. Nice. Very nice. Nani, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about what it's like teaching at Cal Arts. I've always heard such wonderful yeah. things about Cal Arts and, <clears throat> excuse me, and just what a really cool place and a unique place that it is. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I moved to the U.S., one of, um, you know, after like two, three years, I kind of designed this thing in my head where I'm like, that would be the perfect place to be, you know, to, to do my work. That would be perfect. And what I painted in my head was an institution or a place where, all the arts are in one building, are in one place. Because, you know, uh, um, apart from my music dance, I also do graphic designing, I do textile designing, I do web designing. And so, you know, like, I'm like, it would be perfect if I can work at a place that has all these things mm -hmm. together. But after a couple of years, you know, that never came, that never came, came to me. And so I'm like, yeah, this is just, you know, something I'm thinking about that doesn't exist until, you know, until 2013 when I got an email from my assistant boss from Tufts University. And then I went to their website to look at more things and read more stuff. And I'm like, it does exist, you know, and it made me so, so happy and so excited. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to push for this. I'm going to do everything possible to to get this position so and when i went to visit the school when i got you know i got picked as the last four for an interview when i came back home i just was like okay this is it this is where i need to be like this is this is my place so then you know so then i did everything i could and fortunately you know i got i got the job and i got the position and i'm there now but it is an amazing, 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 like I can say, I can repeat amazing enough place to be at, you know, as a, as a student, as a teacher, as an educator, as someone coming from a different uh, country and trying to share their culture and educate people with their culture. It's just an amazing place to be at on so many different levels. And one of them is because, you know, there's a lot of interracial stuff going on there. There are people from China, from India, from everywhere, like everywhere you can think about. And there's a lot of, um, you know, exchange programs going on and each of the instructors are the best at what they do. So, you know, it's like students are getting like the highest, highest, highest people that can represent their country or represent what's, you know, what the music is over there. And the students are really, really great. Like they come in already with a great background. And so then it makes you, the instructor, have a lot of room to work with and a lot of things already set up for you to work with. And for me, it's just like, there is no there is no end to it because that's one of the thing when i was you know when i uh, when i was teaching i'm like okay 
I need to I need to expand. Like what I have to share is more than what you're giving me. It's more than the room you're giving me to share. And they're not allowing me to go any further. And I'm like, but I can do way more than that. Like what I'm doing right now is like just a little. And they 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 couldn't. But at uh, at um, at Cal Arts, it's just like, well, what else can you do? Well, I can do this. Okay, you do it. Okay, now what else can you do? It's like every time you finish a project, there is more room for you to expand and bring something else. So, you know, which is great, which is what I wanted. You know, I want that challenge to always be able to challenge myself, then come back and challenge my student and have it keep going in that circle. So, you know, there's there's amazing thing going on at Cal Arts. The students are amazing. The faculties over there, each of them are really, really professional and great in what they do. And when we come together to perform as as a team, it's, it's just... Is is firework? Is 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 a blast? So yeah, I'm very fortunate to be associated and be working at Colart. And of course, all that you heard, I can I can put a stamp on it. It is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm experiencing it myself. So yeah. Well, you know, one question I have: What aspect would you say is the most challenging to get across to people who are not familiar with this drumming and dancing? Um. Is having them understand um, the cultural aspect and why they should do it. Because Ghanaian music is not just about, I was actually explaining this in a class yesterday. Ghanaian music is not just about playing the music or doing the dance or singing the song. Ghanaian, every single piece that is a traditional piece from Ghana has a story and a history to it. And that is what we, the Ghanaians, stand for. And that's what we're trying to promote, is how to bring that story and bring that cultural aspect out to the audience. And that is when all the rhythm and the polyrhythm and all the movement and all the voice stuff comes in. Like I was teaching in my song class, when I teach one song, I make sure I explain almost word to word to the student because it's not just singing the song it's how you sing the song it's the emotion and the effect that goes into the song make is what makes the song the type of song it is or it represent so like that is what is difficult to kind of get people who are not into this style of music to to come in into to come in to join in you know so what what i've adapted like a um, couple of years ago which call art again is the best place to do it and i'm doing it now is i'm taking the traditional songs and i'm rewriting them and i'm have and i'm playing them on uh, on on western instruments you know so which which is which is working so far because People who are not connected or don't want or don't understand what the traditional stuff is about, they are now beginning to connect because they like the Western instrument because they, they, that's what they know. And now they're hearing something else being played on the Western instrument, which they are not used to by used to because... You know, they're they are used to the Western instrument, but not used to the tradition. And now it's kind of like they're hearing those two together and they're having fun and they are enjoying it. And I was saying yesterday in the class that, you know, I've had a couple of students who were hesitant to take my traditional classes, take my uh, traditional classes because of this. Because I'm offering, I offer that as a course as at ColorArts. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, um, uh, a high life, style of music and through that you know i've had students who, who who started taking my traditional stuff so you know yeah That's so cool can you tell us about your teaching responsibilities at cal arts and the <laughs> african program so uh, i mean my position over there is the head of the african program um, and the african program is designed to offer student mfa so students come there and graduate in, um, uh, you know, MFA in African music and dance. Um, and it's a two years uh, program. Um, and there was about four or four and a half courses or classes before I came in. 
And since I came in, I've expanded it probably to like eight or so. Um, so right now we have we have two uh, music ensemble, one beginning, one advanced. In the beginning, we do all the three aspects of the tradition. So we drum, we sing, we dance. Um, just to give students, since it's a beginning class, to give them a general taste of what Ghanaian music is about so that by the end of the semester or the year, then they have a better idea if they want to continue what they should take next. So then we do that. And then the advance is, is, is being at the top level, um, you know, playing very complex and complicated stuff and uh, things like that. But in the advance, all we do is drumming, nothing else. Um, and then we have two uh, dance classes, one beginning, one advance. Um, and then we have a singing class. And then we have a history class, uh, ethnology of African music. And then we have another class that specifically concentrates on the northern side of Ghana. And then we have a polyrhythm class. Um, and on top of that, of course, we have private lesson and independent studies and all that stuff that goes on behind, uh, behind the main scene. So, yeah, that's, that's what I do. And my, my responsibility is to see to the, the designing of the program, when classes to be offered and, you know, um, um, uh, organizing, buying, putting costume and instruments together. Uh, making sure we have enough, you know, teachers to to be in the class and teaching this stuff. And it's like the general organization of the whole um, curriculum and the course. So, yeah, that's my, that's my position and that's what I do at ColorArt. Um, and I'm beginning to kind of offer another course in textile designing at the school. Um, so that will be cool and it's in the process right now. Um, so it will be cool if that when that goes through because then students can, uh, you know, can take that course, design their, own, uh, design their own fabric, and then make their own costume out of those fabric, then use it for the, for the, for the traditional stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to a great future out at Colors. Yeah. Every time I hear you explain that, I'm like, I want to take a sabbatical and go get an MFA. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's fun. We it's can fun. Take a sabbatical. It's fun because because the place is open, and that's another cool thing about Cal Arts. Like the every, every the whole school is open twenty four seven. Like you go there two a.m. and you see student practicing. You go there like three thirty four a.m. Someone is playing something over there, practicing or something like the place is just, which is great, you know, which is awesome. And it makes the students get to the level that we want them to get to. So when you see our performance, when you see us perform, you will know that, yeah, there is no question that these people are from Colorado. One of, one of my favorite things is just a noisy practice hallway. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. And that's the it thing. My so office. Happy. My office is right by my classroom, my main classroom. And that is where students come to practice because that is where all the instruments are. You have no idea how many times I say in my head, can you guys just stop practicing for, I, I mean, and sometimes I say it to them, like I'm walking to my office thinking I'm going to do a recording and so I need a quiet environment or I'm going to do an online lesson so I need a quiet environment and then I, I approach and I can already hear someone like playing so loud and stuff like that <laughs> and I walk by and I look in and I'm like do you guys take breaks you know you can take breaks right you don't have to be playing all the time right and then they look at me and they're like um yeah but if we come to class not prepared I, we know you're going to start yelling at us. So no, can do, we have to keep playing, you know? So yeah, yeah. The, the noisy, uh, you know, hallway is, is one of the thing. Yeah. For me, it's even yeah. worse because like, I'll come up here and it's like, there's no instrument for me to practice on. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Cause it's because they're using it all. Right. Yeah. 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 Hey, well, Laurel has a question. Her internet is being a little wishy-washy right now, but she would like to know if you design your own textiles for performance. Yes. 
short answer, yes. So one thing I do, which I believe in is when you, when you have something as your main thing, you need to look around that main thing and, and, and figure out if there are other things that comes with that thing. And if there is, it would be a great idea for you to go and, and learn or know about those things. So for me, drumming, dancing, singing, that is the performance aspect. But does costume come with that? Yes. Where are the costumes from? Textiles. So can, can, can I get into textile designing and try to figure that out? Yes. Comes that comes graphic designing, you know. And so then I put myself in that position. And that's why when I went to high school, that's what I studied, you know, graphic designing, uh, uh, visual arts, which came with graphic designing, textile and general knowledge in art. So, yes, I design my own, I design my own, you know, uh, fabric and make, uh, design my own costume and then give it to a friend to sew for me. And we use it for, we use it for our performances. Yeah. And I'm actually currently in a process of um, setting up my own online textile, uh, my own online uh, um, uh, textile designing uh, what shirt and stuff like that. Um, so, yes, the answer is yes. Laurel makes clothes too. She oh really? Yeah, oh beautiful. She, she beautiful. Also, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, maybe she, maybe maybe yeah, I will take your your email address from um from Megan and uh you know we, uh, we could share some stuff together cuz I would love to share some stuff with you. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. I yeah. hope you can hear me. My internet is not Yeah, now I can hear. Oh, you can. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah, no, I think that is so cool and um like personally, you know, I, a lot of the music I perform doesn't have the same um, tradition that you're talking about in the history, but I do find that I perform better if I like make myself something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially That's for yeah. some. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. Because there was <laughs> there was one time at Cal Arts and um, you know I I was thinking I was I was designing an iPhone charger holder in my head and I was like hmm okay let me go to the internet and see if I can get it and I searched for it and I didn't find it all the ones I found was not exactly what I wanted so then I went to Home Depot and I bought some stuff and you know I started working on it at school and someone one of my students came by I was like what are you doing I'm like I'm doing I'm making an iPhone charger and and then he turned around and looked at me and he was like you know you can get that on Amazon, right? And wow. and, I'm, and I'm like, um, yes, I know that, but it's better when I make it. Yeah. You know, I feel better when I make it, so that's why I'm making it. I don't care how long it takes me to do it. You know, so yeah, it that's that's one part for me. Like I, I see it, and I'm like, wow, I made that. Do you know I made that? Whatever that person is wearing on stage, I designed. Like it just gives me that joy to know that, you know, apart from my musical uh, background, that I can do something else in attached to that to make the whole thing a full package, you know? So yeah, I enjoy doing it. That's really cool. You yeah. know, we haven't, one thing we haven't talked about yet is um, when you came to the States and what your first impressions of the States were and, you know, where you've lived in the United States so far. Well, I, I always, when I get that question, I always talk, uh, I, will, I always say it, I even though I don't want to. But when I got picked at the airport at uh, O'Hare, Chicago, by my, uh, uh, my ex-wife, um, we were driving for about an hour. And I was just sitting down, just like laid down like this. And I'm just chilling and just going like this. And she was driving for an hour and I never said anything. And then she turned to me and she's like, you've not said anything. And I'm like, yeah, you expecting me to say something? And she's like, well, you're in America now. I mean, what, what, what do you think? I, I was hoping that you'll be surprised about things. And, and, I, and then I took another look around and I'm like, hmm, 
actually, I thought the America was going to be more beautiful than what I'm seeing right now. <laughs> and no offense, but, you know, with everything I've seen on TV and movies and stuff like that, like I was surprised that there was a lot of trash on the on, you know, on the side of the road at some places, especially in Chicago, you know, and some of the places and, you know, like there was just certain things that didn't click for me like i see on the on the uh, uh, in the movies and you know on tv and stuff like that so then for like a week actually i questioned myself if i was really in the us so you know I, like i'll be looking when we get mails i'll be looking on the mails to make sure that I see USA on yeah. the mail. Like there were certain things I was trying to get to make sure that I, I'm, I'm really in the US. But, you know, but after, after a while, when I started like visiting other places and getting to know more about the country and other states and stuff like that, of course, there are a lot of things that I'm amazed of and still amazed of, you know, like I've never been to California until I got this job. So, you know, like when I got there, that was a big cultural uh, shock for me in terms of what goes on there and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are stuff that I still, um, you know, think is amazing. I mean, of course, there's a lot. That's why I'm still here after 11 years. I'm still here. So there are a lot that I'm learning personally as a cultural thing in the country. Uh, which is very great for me, for my work, and also as a person. So, yeah. It's yeah. interesting when you when you travel, you know, because I've had that exact same experience. You have a, a image in your mind. You have a specific picture of right. what a country a country is supposed to look like. Right. And, and the one that comes to mind is Argentina. You know, we always see the mountains and the snow caps and like the extreme skiing and, you know, and but when you go as a guest artist to visit somewhere, you're often in this one little area or in this exactly. one little school and, and you stay very, very local to right there. Mm -hmm. So you go back and tell your friends, oh yeah, I went to here or there. And they say, oh, did you see? And they start naming yeah. the big sites and you're like, no, I was working. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but the good thing, the better thing about that, I think is you really do. I feel like I do know a lot more about those people and that at, at least that, you know, classical music in that setting around those people because I just stayed with this small group and I didn't go see a bunch of big sites where I'd mm -hmm. likely just run into other tourists. So there's something really beautiful about that. And of course, also, yeah. I got to yeah. say, you know, when the opposite happens, like when I went to Portugal, I didn't really have a, a picture in mind as to what Portugal was. And then we saw a lot of cool things and it was exactly. such a such a pleasant surprise and yeah. just made a really, really big impact. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I I love what you said about you know I asked you what's the hardest thing about getting this music and this art across to these students who don't know it, and you said it was understanding that it's about more than the music and the dance; it's about the culture mm -hmm. and the and the music and dance significance along with the culture and its meaning, right. and and something just struck me because when we talk to our students, I feel we're often trying to do the same thing. We're trying to get to what the music is about mm -hmm. and why they're expressing it and why they should play it expressively. But it's so hard to get past the whole, okay, I'm just trying to do it right. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, and it's so hard to get, it, exactly. to, to get by, you know, it's exactly. so hard to get past that. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. just find it's funny, like whenever I talk to an African music expert, like I'm always asking about the drumming. It's like, well, exactly. that doesn't really, like, yeah. in, you know, early on, like early on this hour, like, it's like that doesn't really exist. It's like the drumming exactly. and the dancing in the sense of yeah. Exactly. Cuz like like and I'm trying so hard to change this, but it's so difficult and I'm going to keep trying. I'm not going to give up. But when when you're talking about 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 music and you just go and say music like there was like for example when I go to a class and I'm like okay today we're work, uh, you know this is the music we're working on then someone would turn around and be like, oh, are we not going to dance then? And I'm like, uh, that is part of the music, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I say music, I mean dancing, drumming, singing. That's what I mean. And they're like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So we're playing instrument and we're, 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 we're playing music and we're dancing too. And I'm like, yes, we're playing music and we're dancing too. But that's the thing in Ghana, you know, 
you don't you don't separate those things and that's why we don't say music meaning instrument and then you have to also include dancing and singing when you say music in ghana you just mean you mean everything you know it's just a combo it just come like that so drummers dance dancers drum singers drum and dance it just goes that way it's just it's just everything all together you know um and and so our, our and that's why the cultural aspect is very important because um you know like when when you get up in the morning when people are cleaning compound and getting things ready to for the day to start they're singing they're dancing they are they are they are mimicking the drum the drum calls and stuff like like everything mostly in our daily life involves involves music throughout the whole day so that is why for us is more about the cultural and the understanding of how this thing is being presented than it is of the main instrument movement or the voice yeah i i think it's interesting for pre for percussionists who spent all their life here maybe studying um studying percussion learning how to use their hands or playing drum set and coordination that way mm -hmm. but not it's another thing to dance and to use your body as an instrument and like right. the first dance class i'd ever taken mm -hmm. was a dog bag wow. ever you know wow. and that's just not you know i'm a musician exactly. in a different you know in, in exactly. a different context yeah. and so but it's also been so cool to witness my students be so open to that mm -hmm. as well you know we've spent more time dancing than playing the drums in the past yeah. few weeks and they totally into it they're yeah. totally into it That's we're true. not a dance school we're not in you know we're not in a dance school and they have loved it and it's helped them to understand yeah. the music mm -hmm. so much more. Yeah. I think that's really yeah. cool. And yeah. something else, you know, Casey, you were, you were hi highlighting some of the things that Nani had said. And another thing I think that goes with that, too, is that it's not about one person, that this music is such a community undertaking. That's another thing. And, you know, a quote a quote from yourself that you, mm -hmm. you said, um, I had the opportunity to interview Nani last June. I yeah. guess, yeah, yeah, for for rhythm scene, he we he was on the cover, and so I interviewed him for that. And one quote was, "You don't go on stage saying I am going to shine. Instead, you go on stage saying I'm going to contribute to us shining. Yeah, and it's not about you. Yeah, it's about us. You know, yeah. and I yeah. think that that also, in in our context where we do have a lot of solo performances too, it's yeah. it's very helpful to remind us that you know that. You know, well, we do a lot of percussion ensemble too, right? So that it's kind of a similar, um, similar lesson, but it's a very helpful reminder that it's not right. solo. Right, right, right. I just had a little something to add. I'm assuming everyone here has probably studied the Bach cello suites, and I actually got to take a class on the Bach cello suites in graduate school. And one thing I had never considered was the fact that, other than the preludes, the Bach cello suites are actually dance suites. All the movements mm -hmm. are dances. And it was one of the most, uh, I'm, I'm just an awkward, uncomfortable person. It was one of the most awkward moments of my life to have to dance the minuet. <laughs> Yay! But having done it, I feel like I have a much more firm understanding of how the minuets and Bach cello suites should go. So, moral of the story, if you're studying the Bach cello suites, look up the dances, because they are dances. <laughs> well, Laurel, didn't you used to teach some of these dances? Yeah, like Baroque dance and Renaissance Specifically dance. Specifically some of these Baroque oh, cool. dances. Yeah, especially to like a music and preach class. It's just something that gets them involved. And it's even better if it falls on Halloween, which I would plan. <laughs> so then they're all in costume <laughs> also. And you, yeah. Yeah. Well, Laurel, you said you had done some African dance. What was your experience like that uh, with that as a percussionist? Oh, yeah, just a little bit. I um. <clears throat> It's not a, it's not nearly as extensive as yours, Megan, but I I remember specifically like I loved the dancing. Like the drumming was fun, but it was also like the thing I was already studying, but what was so interesting to me was yeah, to use just the body as a means of expression and I think like a lot of my research and and activities now Nani have to do with um, the body and understanding how it works and playing in a way that doesn't injure you and things like that. And I feel like to some degree, you know, uh, those dance workshops help to wake that up, wake up a relationship between the mind and body, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I uh, like one of those was at Lawrence University. Um, yeah, oh, with the, it's Dan Richardson. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, that's, yeah. that's the yeah. same. I've done the same one as well. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so and you guys was, went there for a workshop, or what was it? We were actually both there for the Zeltzman Marimba Festival. Ah. That's actually where we met. Mm. I charmed him with my African dance. Huh. So, huh. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I guess we've each done it twice because at separate times we each attended as students independently as in years. And then we were both teaching and that's where we met. So I've only I've only got to do the workshop twice. But I have to say when I was younger, so the first time around, which must have been like right after I finished my undergrad, I have to say I was it was really hard to let go. You know, it was really hard to just let go and just, just do this, just do yeah. these moves. Just, it's yeah. okay. Don't worry about yeah. how silly I look or how, yeah. how poor a job I'm doing. But I, I do remember part of it was, I almost felt like, Oh man, am I insulting this tradition because yeah. I'm so bad at this? And so you have all this hesitation yeah. and it's like, well, here's this thing that is really meaningful and deserves a lot of respect and acknowledgement. And, oh, man, I, I feel so self-conscious, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. looking, you know, doing so poorly at it, you know, so it's hard it's hard to let that go and say, like, yeah. well, look, you're learning and <laughs> just do yeah. it, you know. Yeah, I've, I've had a lot of students like that. Like, I've had a lot of students that come in that I, look, I see them and I know right away, you know, and... Like, I would go to them and just stop them and tell them it's okay. Just let go. Just get out of that shell. It's, it's all good. That's why I'm here. You know, if I will help you, we will get through it. We'll get to where you're supposed to be. Don't even think about it. Just do what I want you to do and you'll be fine. So, you know, that, yeah, there's, there, there are a lot of uh, a few that has that um, self-conscious thing uh, when they're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Hey, I love the quick quotes on your website. <laughs> and I, I guess if this were to lead into a question, it would be, you know, what made you choose these specific ones? So one is when you dance, your purpose is not to get to a certain place on the stage. It's to enjoy each step along the way i think that's great and of course we know what that means but also drum with pride dance with passion sing with joy it, it, there's there's so much there of course and i can think of a hundred different ways to word those great ideas can you can, can you can you tell us maybe how you you know what, what made you decide those specific ones well for me when i'm performing i wouldn't say dancing or drumming uh but when i'm performing specifically dancing, but when I'm performing, that is the moment for me to express myself, to express my inner self, to bring my inner, uh, whatever is happening inside me, that is the time that I bring it out, either in a great way, if I'm doing a recreational piece, um, or in an intense way, when I'm doing like a war or a fetish piece. Um, so for me, it's a moment for me, like performance and, uh, you know, even just teaching those things is a moment for me. And every time I have that opportunity, it's, it's almost like a birthday or Christmas for me where I'm mm -hmm. opening a present or something <laughs> like that. And that is why I have those quotes. So like, I'm not, I'm not rushing. And that's why in our class, I'm like, don't rush. Don't, we, it's not about who gets there first. It's about how do you get there? You know, so for me, each of those steps before I get to completing my main movement or my main thing, each of those steps are like diamond. They are like, they are like moments that I need to enjoy because you know what? They are not going to come again. Even when I repeat that movement again, it will not be the same atmosphere. Even if I do it right on the spot, no, it's, it's still not the same. So each of those movements are like very important to me and I need to connect with my ancestors. I put myself in the shoes of my ancestors. Why, how, what came into their mind for creating this thing? And so I take each of my steps and each of my notes and each of my words 
you know, very special and I process them really nicely and make sure that I am coming out of my staff and audience are really connecting with me. Like I don't do my performance without having audience connect with me. It has to happen. So, you know, that is why I have those quotes because they, they are me. They are me. On yeah. Nani's website, if you are interested in, in going to Ghana or learning more about what he does, there's a really nice section on the website, on his website that ha answers questions um, about um, the study abroad trip mm -hmm. and has more information about the program. So it's really well laid out if you, if you have questions about that. Um, yep, go to and the he, study abroad trip on his tab on his website and and super easy to find too naniagbelly.com so yeah. yeah please check it out everybody hey thank you guys so much for episode 93 and naniagbelly wow really cool to meet you and thank you so much for this just really great information thank you thank you guys so much I'm, I'm very impressed I mean Megan told me about this and I'm like yeah whatever but right now I see it and I'm like oh my goodness uh, I'm so lucky to be here <laughs> oh, so you know thanks to the four of you for you know making me the 93 I really appreciate that I'll find a place to put that 93 um, sure. you know so thank you you guys are doing a great job and you know congrats to doing this every week and uh you know, more grease to your elbows. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Laurel, Ben, Megan, thanks so much. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye-bye, guys. All right. Bye, everybody.